Well, um, I am personally excited really to be here with all of you because my background and my very first job was answering Lorne Michaels' phone. Um, and in doing so, um, I was able to work on several of his shows. And probably the biggest lesson that I got out of that experience is that comedy writers specifically are brilliant and that comedy writers in late night are beyond brilliant. There's a special thing in having to uh, answer to what's going on in a topical way um, that I think is unlike most other mediums and un unlike most other formats. Um, so I'm hopeful we can talk a bit about that and what that is for each one of you. Um, one of the things I'd like to start with is truly how each of you got involved, whether or not this was a passion, something you, were you watching Johnny Carson as a kid? Is this something you fell into? Um, but how did this end up being a, a, tr a profession for you? Um, Jubin, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, uh, let's start with me because it's the most boring answer. Uh, it was a very classic, uh, I was like a short, ugly little kid in middle school and, and made jokes to fit in with every peer buddy. Um, and that's kind of what, how I started getting like a sense of humor. Um, whatever sense of humor I had was mostly just trying to like impress uh, bullies enough not to beat me up. Uh, and I think from, I guess I always had that um, interest uh, in the back of my mind, but I never uh, grew up thinking that comedy was a profession that I could realistically pursue. Uh, I ended up uh, being a lawyer for about four years. I went to law school and practiced law here in New York um, for from 06 to 2010. Uh, at the same time, I did I started doing uh, improv comedy at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater uh, in Manhattan. Um, and over time, as I performed there and sort of rose in the comedy scene, my friends started getting jobs in professional late night shows, professional writing jobs in late night shows, and I began getting the feeling that that's something I could do too. Uh, and in 2010, I, I left my firm and made the jump to comedy writing full time. And I then, my first job uh, in comedy writing was The Daily Show, which is outrageously fortunate and I would not recommend uh, as, as a realistic career path for anybody, but that's how I ended up getting my job. Thanks. Thanks. So I have a completely non-traditional uh, career path, and I'm the baby on this panel. I've been at the Nightly Show for officially three months. Yeah. Woo. So take all my advice with a grain of salt. Um, so I went to school for acting um, and then transferred and studied graphic design after I realized that I'd make a terrible waitress because um, I'm very clumsy. And... Um, my love of the internet really kind of got me interested in making content for YouTube. Uh, YouTube was launched my senior year of college. I had always been really um, active on the internet, and it was a really great place for me to showcase the things that I was interested in while also working a boring job as a graphic designer. Um, and the most Cliff Notes version is I had been making videos for four years when I had a viral video in 2012, Shit White Girls Say to Black Girls. And I was able to um, make lots of white girls cry and quit my day job and then, um, you know, make tons of videos, which was very exciting. And then I was a guest on Larry Wilmore's show. And um, after I was a guest, I had a meeting with them, and they were like, why don't you work here? And I was like, why don't I work here? <laughs> um, and yeah, and so, so now here I am, a fresh, a fresh three months in, giving advice as if I know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, but it's been, it's been really exciting, and TV is something I've always wanted to do, and so I'm very fortunate that YouTube was able to open that door for me because I started making videos because I didn't find a place for myself in mainstream media as a black woman, um, and I wasn't seeing the types of stuff that I wanted to do, so I was able to make it, and then now I'm at a place where the things that I've made have opened a door for me to have a, a regular, really cool job. I, I have another untraditional uh, root story into comedy writing. I uh, started writing in, in high school, and I was a really good student and, and did my physics and math and everything, but uh, when it came time to, to keeping a journal, which was one of the assignments, I, I discovered that was what I really enjoyed doing. I looked forward to actually writing. Uh, so I, I took that to heart and uh, got into Harvard and majored in engineering and applied physics. 
so, so the lesson there is just pay attention to what you really enjoy doing, even in high school or in college, because that, that could turn out to be something that you, you make your career at. So I studied engineering, um, uh, but uh, every day at the end of the day after classes, I would drop by the Harvard Lampoon. I got on the Harvard Lampoon, and that was where I wound up spending most of my time and where I really discovered that it's fun to make fun of people and, and, and write jokes. So uh, I took that to heart and uh, worked in marketing, went to business school. <laughs> um, I still was resisting the idea that you could actually make a living uh, writing comedy. Eventually, I, I had friends who left the Lampoon and were starting to get into television. Uh, a good friend of mine uh, was one of the early writers on Saturday Night Live, and uh, he turned out to be uh, David Letterman's early head writer, one of his early head writers, in addition to Meryl Marco. And uh, at one point, he and a few other writers on, on Late Night with Dave Letterman were thinking of leaving, and, and Jim, my friend, didn't want to leave Dave without a writing staff, so he started asking his friends, who he thought might be interested in writing comedy, would you like to, to write a submission packet and try to get a job on Late Night? And I said, yeah, <laughs> that sounds great, because I, I, I thought that all my friends who were doing that were having a lot more fun than I was. Uh, so I, I wrote a submission packet, and, and that was... I got hired. I was lucky enough to get hired in the early days of Late Night with David Letterman, and it actually worked, and, and it stuck, and I f discovered I could do it, and uh, I, that turned out to be what I made my living doing. So uh, so now is a great time to, to be exploring comedy, if you're thinking of that. Uh, now you're in college, uh, join a sketch group, write comedy, do YouTube videos, because uh, that's, that's where the seeds were planted for my career, and uh, I didn't really pay attention to them. Uh, I'm glad I went to business school because I, I learned to do things there that I, I still use today. I, I picked up some tools there, but uh, but you don't have to go to business school to to make a career in television comedy. Um, and then I know that you have a clip that you could show, Francesca. Maybe that will give a bit of an idea of a certain kind of segment, um, and you could give us a little color going into it about about what it is. Sure. Um, so, you know, it's really cool that The Nightly Show has given me an opportunity to merge my voice with the show. And, you know, I am someone who lives, eats, sleeps, and breathes internet, for better or for worse. Um, and so Larry posed the idea that I could create a segment that is about some trends that are happening on the internet. So um, I recently started a new segment called Hash It Out, which is all about who's mad at who on the internet this week. Week. Um, so I brought a little clip of one of my recent pieces. Welcome back. Now the world of social media moves pretty fast these days. Hashtags rise and fall. Instagrams are deleted and Snapchats disappear in an instant. So to help us uh, keep up, we're starting a new segment called Hash It Out with Francesca Ramsey. Francesca? <laughs> It's March, and you know what that means. It's Women's History Month. And this past Tuesday was also International Women's Day. Now, I know what you're thinking. Isn't that excessive? Do women really need an extra special day in their special Women's Month? Maybe you're right. But then again, women have periods, carry babies, and make significantly less money <laughs> than men do. So we're keeping the day. Sadly, no matter how many days we get, women never seem to have it easy, and that holds just as true on Twitter. The first big social media freakout this week came when reality TV star Kim Kardashian tweeted out a nude selfie with the caption, when you're like, I have nothing to wear, LOL. Okay, certainly nothing we haven't seen before, no big deal. At least I thought it wasn't until I checked Twitter. Here are a handful of the responses. You're a mother. You're a mother. <laughs> and of course, my favorite, that's not the way you should carry yourself as a mother and wife. That's not how she should carry herself as a wife. She's married to Kanye West. <laughs> I mean, this is a dude who has lyrics about not wanting to get asshole bleach on his t-shirt. <laughs> He's not exactly Reginald Vell Johnson. Sorry, ever since we found out that other guy was a serial rapist, Reginald's now the go-to TV dad.
that was great. Um, it lends itself to the question, I think, a little bit too, um, in terms of the content that you're creating. Um, some of it is evergreen. Some of it is touching on specific points in the way that that, if that one did. And some of it are truly topical to the day. Um, can you speak to a little bit to the your overall week? You know, the makeup of of that kind of content and what it what it what the makeup is and how you schedule it for yourself. Um, so yeah, I this is this is so cool to, for me because we have so many different levels of um, background in in late night, and my perspective is very much like every day. I'm like, holy shit. Every single day. Like we start at 9 a.m. and we tape at 6.30 and the whole day you're just like, what, what, this happened now? Okay, great, now I'm changing this. Okay, like I thought this was gonna, like this thing happened last night and then like, oh my God, I just saw this this new development in a story so now I have to kind of change this around. Um, and it's very fast paced um, and not something that I was I don't think anyone can really prepare you for that. Like you think you have an understanding of what the day is gonna be like. Um, but the thing that really helps me um, that I do in my personal life is it's very scheduled. So we know that there's a meeting at 9 a.m. and then your scripts are due at 10.30 and then like joke pick happens and then we have our production meeting and then we've got, you know, um, you go into hair and makeup and then we have rehearsals. So like I know like what benchmarks happen throughout the day. So that's really helpful for me. Um, besides that, you know, it is a topical show. So we are talking about things that happened that week or that day. Um, but I do like to try and infuse themes that can live on because I like for content to live on the internet. And I think that that's really important for that element to be there so that it can be evergreen if possible or just one section that you can make into a GIF. Like I like to think of jokes as things that you can stand alone and you don't have to see the whole segment um, to hopefully draw people in so they'll want to watch the whole segment or they'll want to watch the whole show. Um, so it's been really interesting trying to wrap my mind around thinking about writing jokes in both of those ways in one piece. And Jubin, in your position where you're organizing a lot of this and how the content comes in, um, it's kind of the same question. Is there a uh, thought at the beginning of the week in terms of how it's going to be structured in terms of, mo you know, the, the monologue jokes versus sort of uh, the other segments involved and how they are assigned and what does that look like? It's definitely the, the structure of the day allows there to be some stability because the stories are so rapidly changing. When, especially like as a writer, there's a, you're usually one part of this larger machine. When you move up into uh, as a head writer, you are sort of seeing a lot more of the pieces as they're flying back and forth and like grabbing them, editing them, changing them, moving them out. So you usually... Um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of management of the day that you don't really think of as late night. I think like a lot of people think of late night writing as like a Thirty Rock episode where like all the writers are always doing some weird thing that has nothing to do with writing. And in reality, like a lot of the write a lot of the day is like very highly regimented. Francesca's schedule is actually very similar to ours. We have we're the same sort of sister shows, and there's an enormous amount of deadlines throughout the day. So I would say that usually what whatever we get at the morning uh, to see what the stories of the day are, that varies wildly, but like the machinery usually stays the same. So no matter what is thrown at you, it's like, great, you have to write a uh, draft about that in like an hour and a half. And then as the day goes on, there are certain points at which you are able to inject like new stuff that comes in, but there's definitely a... Uh, a structure that just has to exist because the, the cameras come on at 9.30 or 6.30 whether you want them to or not. Um, it's, it's amazing how much of, of a late night show's uh, life is trying to build a, uh, a track as the train is barreling towards you uh, and how, uh, how intensely creative you can be under deadlines that close and tight and oncoming. Lauren always says it goes on because it's 11.30, not because it's ready. Yeah. Um, and I think there's probably a similar process uh, th through late night and what that looks like. Um, we have more flexibility, too, because we can always just, we can always, if we have to, delay taping, you know, right, a 20, a bit uh, of uh, yeah, half an hour. But oh. yeah, as Saturday Night Live, as a live show, you guys don't have the luxury at all. Yep. Um, politics, a uh, uh, political year, is that sort of a gift? Does oh, that completely. A complete yeah. gift. It's, <laughs> yeah, well, if, the, if, the, if the material itself is funny to watch, like if you're watching 
Ted Cruz say something so asinine that the audience reacts to that, that's a gift. You don't need to, you know, the joke is just like an icing on the top. If you're, if you're watching a news story that's, you know, about, you know, 30 dead in a prison riot in, in Albuquerque, it's like, oh, how are we going to make a joke out of this? Like the audience, we come out of that and the audience is like, wow, that's really sad. And so like election years usually have that kind of joy and, and, and chaos that usually, and also they're so prolific with what the stories. There's so much that happens every day that it's like always a wonderful year when it's election year. And Joe, do, have you felt that you've been able to uh, indirectly or directly influence politics um, through what's going on in the show? That's a really interesting question. I, I think we're kind of like a, a major network show, like a late show or a tonight show. I think uh, the priorities are a little bit different uh, from working on a cable show uh, because you, you have to attract millions more people. Uh, to, to make a, a success of a, a late night show on NBC or CBS or, or ABC, uh, you need three or four million viewers a night. And, and that means that if... Um, if you're doing a joke that involves politics, uh, or what's happening in the, the presidential race, uh, you have to be uh, you have to be more careful about what your jokes are saying, because you can't afford to turn off half your audience. So that kind of relates to the, the the question of does telling a joke about politics actually change anybody's opinion? And and I don't actually think it does. Uh, I, I, I don't think anybody who hears a joke about Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, I, I, I don't think they're ever going to change their opinion of what Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, would, would their, their feelings about those people. Uh, I think all your, I think one of the reasons that, that people laugh at a joke is because they kind of agree with what you're saying, which by definition means they're not going to change their mind based on your joke. Uh, so I, so I, I, think, uh, I, I think that it's really, I don't know, what do you guys think? Is it, do you think do you think people actually change their minds about issues or change their minds about about the candidates uh, when you when you do a comedy piece? Yeah, I I absolutely think people's minds change by jokes because your inhibition is lowered and you're more receptive to information. I think I think jokes have the power to reinforce positive and negative ideas, especially when you know one of the things that we do on our show that I that really drew me to it is we try to give a voice to the underdog. And a lot of times those are voices that have not had a place to tell their own stories. So when you look at traditional media and you see people telling the same old jokes that punch down on those people, it reinforces ideas about those people because they may have never heard jokes or heard the voices of those actual people. So I do think that, yeah, sometimes if people believe something, a joke is not going to change their mind, but I think a joke can open their eyes to a new perspective on something that they think that they already know or that they um, have not heard before and it might make them think of something in a new way um, or you know possibly influence them to think about something differently I, 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 I do agree with part of that that I think that uh, one thing that uh, the, the the Daily Show and Larry Wilmore, or any show, one thing uh, that those shows can do is just introduce people to the issues. Uh, there, you'll hear that uh, a lot of a lot of young people are getting their news from the late night shows, and and it, to to that extent, I think it's it's great if if uh, if a late night show can talk about an issue that somebody hasn't even heard of, and so that way they can form an opinion and maybe uh, find out more information on their own. Uh, so, so I do think that that's, th that does contribute to the, the political conversation, just just dealing with the topic. People may not have heard of it before. And I do see, I do see the difference in an overall voice of a network, so to speak, and uh, the way things have grown in terms of hosting and what that means and tr speaking in the voice of the host, which is something that's very unique, I think, to late night also in the way that you write. A lot of it is directed about the relationship that you have with the host on that show. Um, how do you feel about it in terms of the, the political nature? Um, do you feel that, that there is a pushing of an agenda in comedy? Um, I wouldn't say purposefully, if that makes sense. I mean, do you feel that it's a product of, of comedy itself? I, I definitely think every joke has a direction to it, and that every, every joke has a target. And so making a joke is, in a way, a political statement. Um, whether I think that affects political sensibilities in the country I don't I don't really think so at least not in a in such a pointed way that you can see it happen and I don't necessarily know if that should be the point of a late night comedy show I do think that 
our idea is like we are a comedy show that that has a point of view. Uh, it is not a uh, it is not a, uh, a journalism uh, show or a political show that uses comedy uh, to make its points. Um, and I think that's a very a, a very important difference. The joke is always our top priority. It's always what is the funniest angle on this? What's something that makes us all laugh? We it, the best one the best kinds of those jokes tend to be in a direction because satire is, is sharper and it's it's funnier and as opposed to you know the broader kind of jokes that tend to just have like inoffensive themes. But I I don't think that that's the same thing as saying that we are a political uh, entity trying to make an agenda, trying to advance some uh, point of view and change the culture or or the the politics. If that is a byproduct of uh, of of any show, especially if it comes to like introducing new voices and and creating more perspectives, then I think that is that could be really beneficial. But I don't think that I think if a show tries to make that the point of view, and more importantly, I think that if writers who are trying to get onto those shows think that that's the point of those shows, they're going to be very disappointed. They're going to find themselves not advancing in their careers as far as people who recognize that the point of a comedy show is to is to make comedy. Um, in terms of uh, sort of what drove you to do what you're doing, um, both of you, Francesca and Jubin, I know you previously from the online world. Do you feel that that is a, um, a true driver now uh, for finding up and coming talent uh, for, the co for the shows that you're on? I mean, is that a place where you mine talent? Is that a place where you're looking for new writers and... and I mean, you're, you're the embodiment of that, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's how I got my job, you know? And I think for me, I love that about the internet because not everyone has the ability to move to New York and take expensive comedy classes. And, you know, for me, I had a regular job and I worked very late hours. And so I moved to New York and I was doing stand-up and then I couldn't do stand-up anymore because I was working as a designer and some nights I wouldn't get out till 11 or 12 o'clock at night and I like to sleep. So, you know, YouTube was a place where I could still write and perform, but I could do it from the comfort of my home and I could make a little bit more money than, you know, the free drinks I was getting at the bar. Um, and so there are lots of people who are getting book deals and writing television shows and web series, but they don't live in LA or they don't live in New York, but they're able to open those doors from wherever it is that they live. And I think that that's really cool. And interestingly enough, also, it's switching the other way. So meaning late night happens to do incredibly well on the web, um, and I think we've seen uh, true evidence of that, and I'm curious, Joe, if, if you've seen that change just as an observer of, of how late night has shifted. Uh, uh, many people probably won't uh, agree with me, but I, I don't really think that, uh, that the internet and, and, and videos going viral has really changed the, the nature of the content of late night. I think late night television has, has always been about coming up with a self-contained three or four minutes of comedy that you can fit between two commercial breaks. And if it's visual and involves celebrities, uh, uh, if it's fun uh, and, and different, um, it, that's great for the show. The fact that you can now take that three or four minute piece and, and put it on YouTube and get 90 million views, I think is great. I think it's great for promoting the show, but I, I don't think it changes the kind of comedy that, that late night writers have always had to write for a show like that if they, they want to be successful and they want the show to, to do well. Um, and I think there's a, also I, I think that uh, it, there was an article I read, uh, uh, Bill Carter wrote an article, it was in the Hollywood Reporter, and he got a quote from Jimmy Kimmel. And Jimmy Kimmel said, uh, you know, we don't really write for the internet, uh, especially since there isn't very much money there. So I don't really think late night is all about videos going viral. Uh, I think it's about doing exciting, fun comedy that people want to watch, and it always has been. I think it definitely uh, is a talent finding machine more than maybe an innovative content machine. It definitely you you we you you bring in comics you otherwise would not have seen or, or heard about. Um, but I definitely, but I definitely agree that the two styles are very similar. They're both in very small chunks. Maybe if anything, it's it's taught late night to be even faster and tighter in how they deliver 
uh, these comedy chunks. What could have been handled in eight, seven or eight minutes now is almost certainly going to be chopped down to like three or four. I think it's kind of raised the stakes in terms of making jokes because like black Twitter makes jokes like instantly. You know what I mean? Like you'll sit down to write a joke about something and you know, just a quick Google search. I'm like, damn it. Everybody has made the like, you know, making it rain Harriet Tubman's on on strippers. Like everybody has made that joke like 8 million times on Twitter already. So like what's the different better angle? Because there's lots of people instantly coming up with memes and, and graphics and you know, we have an entire graphics department and the internet makes some of this stuff so fast. So you really have to like use the resources like the video production that you have. You almost you have to right. do stuff that they can't. Yeah, do. you have to take it up yeah. to like the next level. Yeah. The day that you all are writing and creating, are you aware and purposely looking at what other people are writing and creating or are you purposely not looking? Or a mix of We're both, like, if that makes sense. I well we don't look directly. If a joke has been made on Twitter so much that by osmosis, one of us is like, uh, I, I saw that on Twitter already. Because we do have a bunch of people who just are on Twitter a lot just because they're, they're, they're just young people who live in, in America. And <laughs> that, 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 if that happens, then like, we won't use that joke. But I don't, I don't think you can be, um, I, I think you will, you will drive yourself crazy if you're constantly searching for um, whether someone has said your joke in any context in any way. And speaking of Twitter and, and speaking of uh, the internet and, and a way to get your material out there, uh, there's there's a story which is actually true of a a writer who is discovered on Twitter. Like up to now, you've been telling us all false stories. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's I, one cause, story. Because because I actually told a story once and, and I thought it was apocryphal, but then I, I I spoke to somebody at NBC and she said, no, that actually happened. Uh, uh, so it's not apocryphal. It's actually true. Uh, it's a, a guy who's working, I think, in IT in, in, in somewhere in the Midwest, and he just posted funny jokes on Twitter. And his jokes came to the attention of somebody who worked on the Seth Meyers show, and he was invited to, to submit material to the show. He got a job, and I think he's still working there on staff as a writer. So he was discovered through Twitter. So, so it, it, YouTube videos are great, but if, if all you can do is, is uh, post some jokes on Twitter, uh, some topical jokes, uh, monologue-type jokes, just Put them on Twitter, and I think yeah, I think there's several writers. I, I know, I think like Megan Amram, uh, who uh, was a uh, who was who writes for a lot of sitcoms out there, got her start on Twitter. There's yeah, there's, there's been a more. bunch. Yeah, yeah, that that's, that's a, a lot. Common avenue now to being hired. And, and now people people who are looking to hire writers, uh, if they hear the name of a writer, they might say, oh, it is the person on Twitter, and they'll just go on Twitter, and it's just an easy way to sample the candidate's comedy. Just going online with no risk at all. You don't have to ask for a resume. The other yeah. side of that, though, that I will say, because I do sometimes see really funny people on Twitter, and I think, you're giving so much of this away. Like, what are you actually... Like, a lot of people, I feel like, don't end up getting any ownership over their work online. And I think Twitter is one of those spaces where it's very difficult. It's so reactive, right? Yeah. That it's almost like if they, if you took the time out to figure out the ownership part, you would have missed the now of the tweet. Yeah, so I do think you have to kind of pick and choose in the sense that if what you really want is like a, a career as a comedy writer, like you can't give away all of your best stuff on Twitter, but like that's really the time to like start working on your, your writer's packet or have a website or have some place where you actually own your work, you know, if your Twitter gets flagged tomorrow and gets taken down, like, are you completely screwed because you lost all these followers and all these great jokes? Or do you have them housed someplace that belongs to you and people can know that that is your work and someone else didn't steal it or take credit for it? We've had a fair amount of success with uh, either in-house writers that are above average or channel partners that are above average that have gotten staffed on shows. And I do think maybe because it just adds to the resume, meaning there's something that you can actually show to put forward, but agree with you that it doesn't necessarily transfer joke for joke, if that makes sense. So, yeah. um, and I will say though, I, I bet Jimmy Kimmel is making some money on those videos. Absolutely. Do you know what I mean? Like, I, th I, th I, th I, th I, there is yeah. money to be made, and I do think I've that's seen those ads and yeah, I was going to say there, <laughs> there's, there's a lot, there's a lot changing in that space. I do think, and where the ability to produce in terms of lower dollars and the money actually increasing over time. I don't necessarily think that's a competition, by the way, or in lieu of in any way. It's a complement to, um, or at least that's. That's my look at it. I, I, I don't know if, if I, I'm not this far up in the pay grade, but I don't know if, if uh, our corporate parents see it that way. I think there's a lot of fear of, of how to monetize internet views um, that 
that I think is reflected in some corporate decisions, um, not necessarily ours, but other ones about how much stuff to put on YouTube, for example, or how much to, um, how much additional content uh, we should put online, like solely for like Snapchat or Facebook. And I think that reflects, I can't imagine there's not some rationally based fear of, of how much money can be taken from the internet, at least right now. I, I, I think that as time goes on, this is fighting a losing battle. The internet will eventually sort of consume um, television and, and late night writing in particular. But I don't think right now our corporate overlords know how to make money off that. And I think that results in a very zigzaggy approach to uh, getting online from, from show to show. You'd think they would have figured this out by now. Like, I think so, yeah. yeah do, we, do we air 30 seconds of this, this fabulous four-minute comedy piece? Do we air the whole thing? Do we do it the day after? Uh, yeah, I mean, these are the industries that, like, you know, wouldn't, did nothing to stop Napster except sue them instead of, like, adopting, yeah. like, recognizing that music was going digital. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of, like, um, there's not as much innovation in, in, in corporate America as you might think there is, or at least not a lot of adapt, adaptability. Yeah, they're just trying to figure it out now. I think it's just a, a matter of the fact that a lot of people didn't take the internet seriously for a really long time, even to this day. Like when I talk to people about what I do or how I got my job, I think a lot of them are still very like, mm, oh, you make like vines or something? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm not a viner. Like I have standards. <laughs> but I mean, but I think it's all of us. I was the same way about Snapchat. I talked so much crap about it and now I love Snapchat. You know what I mean? And now I think TV is trying to figure out like how do we utilize Facebook? Like people's videos on Facebook are getting more views than people tune in for the show. But how do you get that to translate to someone tuning in for 22 minutes versus two minutes? I don't know the answer, but I think that TV, like you said, has to figure it out and they're desperately trying to. Um, so I have one last final question, but and then I think we're going to take some, some questions. But um, the question I have is truly an advice. If you were to tell somebody who was an up-and-coming writer and this was their aspiration, what to do, what to focus on, um, things you've learned, maybe things to avoid, I think uh, that would be an interesting thing for this room to hear. Um, and Joe, I'm actually going to start with you, in part because uh, I have read the the book that you've written, which I find absolutely... You mean comedy amazing. writing for late night TV? <laughs> <laughs> is that the book you're talking about? Here. Is that on your lap? On oh, look, lap. you actually have it there. Just so you know. Wow. Um, but it's fascinating, and it's quite methodical in the way you're thinking. You know, you know what I mean? And there's a lot of t truly taught things in there. Um, and so I guess I'm just curious in terms of if you're somebody who this is what you think you want to do, uh, what, would be that st what would be a step for you that you could take to move in that direction? Well, with, I know this is self-serving, but uh, if you're at all interested in, in, in writing jokes, writing sketches, uh, I, I think the, the, the book is a good investment because, <laughs> because just honestly, I don't think there's another book out there like it that, that, that breaks down, that I know it sounds self-serving, but breaks down a comedy writing step by step. Uh, and for, for the cost of uh, a book on Amazon, you, you, you will just learn so much from that. Uh, as an extension of that, that's, so that's the first thing you can do. Uh, the second thing is just involve yourself in the comedy community. It's, if you think you might be interested in comedy, uh, take a stand-up class, take a, a sketch class, do improv. Uh, it, it, try it on as, as to find out whether you're good at it, whether you enjoy it. Uh, and, uh, and in parallel to that, I would say start uh, your writing samples. Start writing sketches. Uh, start posting jokes on Twitter. Uh, start developing a, a body of, of writing that you can refine over the years. If a lot of it is evergreen material, it'll, it'll hold up. It won't get stale uh, very quickly. And, uh, and then you'll have a, a writing sample that you can present if the ca occasion presents itself. Uh, if somebody's looking to hire somebody or somebody wants jokes for an event, uh, you can give them a writing sample and you'll be ready. So um, mingle with other people in the comedy community, trade information, tips, try it on as, a, as an activity, see if you enjoy it, and, and also just write and, and see if you're good at it and if you enjoy it. Yeah, I think writing daily and getting in the habit of it and, and challenging yourself to write on certain topics or write in a time frame is really important. Um, a lot of times when people ask me for career advice, they say, I really want to do this thing. I want to do this. And it's like, well, just do. 
Like you can talk about wanting to do something and then at some point you just have to try and do. Um, when I was doing stand-up, my girlfriends and I would do a 10 joke a day challenge where we would have to email each other 10 jokes every day. And like eight of those jokes were terrible, but two of them would be pretty good. And then by the end of the week, you would have like a handful of decent jokes. Um, and that was just a matter of like, you just have to do. Um, so I think that that's really important. Um, and then I would say, you know, really trying to force yourself to write about things that are happening that you're interested in, but then things that you're not that interested in too. Because one thing I've learned is sometimes you get an assignment and you're like, I don't know anything about this story. I'm not really passionate about it, but like how do I find what makes me like tick about this story? And so just looking on your newsfeed and saying, what is this story about? What can I say that's really funny about it? I feel like that's a good way to just get your brain around the idea of finding creative ways to tell a story about something that everyone's talking about or interested in. Uh, yeah, I would I would repeat uh, what they said basically. And uh, it, it's critical to write constantly, but it's just as critical to get your material in front of other people. I think the only way you really learn what's funny about your writing is by constantly putting it up for uh, either acceptance or rejection. Um, whether that means uh, taking sketch classes or improv classes or just doing stand-up, you constantly want to be in live fire situations, so to speak. Like, you always want to be performing in front of as many audiences as possible and seeing how they react uh, to your jokes. That's the only way you kind of intuitively, intuitively get how a joke needs to work and what about your voice um, can be funny and how it can be funny. And, and also to, to Joe's point, you really should be in a comedy community of some sort. As those people rise up with you, they recommend you for jobs. It's really, this is a business of people who know each other. There's no one wants to work with someone they don't like. Um, and that's why it's really important to be in a comedy community, constantly putting up as much of your work in front of people as you can all the time. Um, and if you're, if you're talented, and this is also going to the Twitter thing, like funny people recognize that jokes are, uh, and ideas are a dime a dozen. You don't ever need to be precious about certain jokes. And you'll find out once you start writing comedy that uh, you, jokes that you think are gold, everyone else will just like silently wait for you to finish and then move on. And there'll be like an embarrassed silence in the room. And if you, the, the faster you learn that funny is not like in an, a, a joke, it's like a voice, it's an attitude that doesn't need, uh, don't be precious with your jokes. And you learn that the more you do comedy. So do it a lot in front of people in a comedy community. Um, so I, I would like to open this to questions now. I would say, just as an added thing to what you just said, I do believe that the comedy community is uh, an incredibly generous community mm -hmm. in, and incredibly supportive. Um, and just ditto to, to what you all said about uh, getting in front of those people. And you all are very fortunate because tonight you have them sitting here. Um, so hopefully you have some questions and we can take the opportunity to have them answer. I was wondering since a lot of the content on late night shows is political, um, do you ever run into obstacles when you're writing because of political disagreements like among the writers? Um, yeah, we have a, a pretty diverse uh, political viewpoint in our writing room. So we usually do have uh, a, lot of, a lot of our morning meetings will become debates about what we want to say and the points we want to make and usually Ultimately, Trevor is the deciding factor of what we end up saying, but he's very good about incorporating alter the different points of view and going through that. So usually if you, and I, again, back to the comedy part of it, if you have an, al an alternative point of view or like a disagreement, if you just say it and then go quiet, everyone will just kind of move on. That's why you have to always have like the comedic angle to your point of view. You have to be able to, to uh, express it in a way that has like a funny, thought behind it or a comedic resolution and funny stuff gets in the show regardless of its political affiliate well i mean it pro i mean we don't have nazis on staff but like that probably <laughs> is not gonna but if you like if you, if you can express your your point of view in a, in a joke in a funny way that even someone who disagrees with you laughs at that's usually um always incorporated into the show um so i would say these disagreements usually provide like fodder like they churn up the ground for more jokes than than like stop us on the way over to any uh final product Yes. Hi, this is directed towards Francesca. So I'm also interested in creating content around race, gender, sexuality. So something that I'm really interested in is kind of like making stuff of trying to 
reach a demographic that might not be aware about something? So like when you did like shit that white girls say to black girls, is there something you thought about that you're like, okay, how do I reach a closed minded white girl about some subtle racism for them to laugh and wake up and like, oh yeah, we do say that. And like, that's the type of work that I like to do that I could even be able to reach someone that wasn't open to it and then laugh at it and then be like, oh wow, I should think differently. So like, I what were even like some feedbacks from like some white girls about that? Um, <laughs> read the comments, they're <laughs> horrific. Um, something that I've really tried to do more of, um, I wrote for Upworthy for a hot minute and I learned so much there. And one of the things that they really encouraged us to do is it's, it's easy to preach to the choir. And so I think especially for people that do have a more liberal, progressive stance, slant, you know, I realized that I had never actually watched Fox News. Like the only time I'd seen Fox News was like other people making fun of it. And so I think it's important to engage with content from people that think differently from you to understand like what they're actually listening to and what they're actually connecting to and the language that's being used there and like how it reaches them. Um, those news outlets speak in a very different way than, than we speak and the things that we appeal to them um, is, is very, very different. Um, and so I think that that's really important. And then the other thing that I try to do in my work is I try to use myself as an example. I think anytime you talk about sensitive issues, it's really hard when it turns into like, you need to wise up because you suck about this. <laughs> like if you say like, I had to learn that I was a, I used to say transphobic things too, and like now I'm better. Then people are like, oh, we're doing this together. Like, <laughs> it's not all about like yelling at someone. So if you can make yourself part of your work, you know, make fun of yourself, um, I think that that helps get people's guard down. It makes them more receptive to the joke or whatever it is that message you're trying to um, impart on them. Thank you. Yes. Hey guys, thanks for doing this. Um, I have a question that's kind of the opposite side of the spectrum, but I'm curious and I don't know what type of answer I want to hear. We talked a lot about um, your life between 9 and 6.30, but what happens after that? Obviously, the show comes on at 11. Are you guys writing? I mean, do they let you out other, to, other than doing panel discussions? We have to go right back to the office after this, obviously, but like we can still hang out beforehand. My ass is going home. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Head writer versus writer difference. Uh, I w we actually like um, at, le at least at our show, like we have, uh, we're always looking forward to the next day's show. Um, so, you know, like tonight, for example, I'm I'm going to go home and I'll be watching like the news networks for the primary results that happen tonight in, in preparation for tomorrow's show. So I think you're. Although it's great in, on, a, on a daily show that you can always like l immediately like forget the day's show because it's over and done with and move on to the next day, there's always that kind of, you're always sort of thinking, even when you're not really at work, you're always kind of thinking about jokes and every time you hear or see something, you're kind of like processing it through like a, what can I make a joke about this sort of angle? Um, so y usually we all end up going home around eight or nine, but you're never really totally done uh, thinking about the show. Um, from from my perspective. Yeah, uh, agreed. I mean, we have an awesome research team that sends us like emails in the evening and first thing in the morning, whether it's updates on the primaries or some breaking story happened. Um, and I think I'm really fortunate in the sense that I've always been very plugged in. So even though I'm scrolling through my Twitter for personal reasons, I'm also still looking and seeing like, oh, that's a really interesting story and emailing it to myself or emailing it to our research team and saying like, this would be something really good for tomorrow's show. So you kind of don't really stop working because the news cycle doesn't stop. You know, um, it's always happening. So, you know, when I go home, I do check my emails and I have like the sites that I always go to and I get emails from like New York Times and I have like Google Alert set up for certain things that I'm interested in. Um, so you kind of are always are always looking and, and trying to figure out what you can be talking about or what you should be talking about. And then uh, on a show like The Tonight Show and uh, and The Late Show, it's, it's a little less structured in that th there can be there can be days where you have nothing planned for the next day. You have no comedy planned. Maybe something you had counted on, uh, uh, 
just fell through for, for some reason, and uh, the, the writers might have to stay late after the show to, to come up with an idea to, to write jokes for, for a piece that you need for the next day. If the next day is set and, um, and the day after that, maybe there's a hole a day after that that you'll have to fill, but you can do that tomorrow, then, then people can, can leave at a, a more reasonable hour. So um, my question is, <laughs> I'm in the TV club at my school, and I was really interested in taking a position as head writer. And one of the things I was interested in in, in taking that position was finding a way to implement uh, and get writers, interested writers, to collaborate and create scripts and jokes for like a full show. So with that being said, I was wondering, my question was, what's the collaboration process among the writing team, if there is one? And um, how do you put jokes and scripts together with like a large group of people? Because I'm really curious about how to be able to do that. Good question for you, Shubin. Yeah, um, with us, there's part, uh, the initial steps are collaborative. When we gather around to talk about what we want the this, this story to be, like the headline, which is usually what we call each specific act in the show, um, the initial uh, coming up with like the angle that we have, any like major comedic bit we have, and just any like riffing that w jokes we come up with, just like room riffing, all happens uh, first. And then once we have a sense of what we want the point of the, uh, the of the story to be, what are the major beats we want it to be, and what the funniest jokes are that people are coming up with, the writers will separate out, and usually two of them will go and write up a separate draft of that story. Um, and then when they come back um, to me with those scripts me and the executive producers will take them and sort of with that, with these new drafts, figure out what we want the story to go, what of those jokes we wanted, what are the takes they came up with on their own that are even better than the ones we come up in the room, and then we'll send it to them to go write a second draft together. Um, so I think the in those writing processes, you want like, you want initial sort of large, um, initial freedom of, of thought and takes but as the writers, uh, once you kind of like begin to get like a, once the shape of it begins to have a little bit of rigidity, you definitely want the writers to, at least in my opinion, go and work through some thoughts themselves and add their own particular voices to it. So I think having a mix of like everyone in the room and also everyone separating out and coming up with their own stuff helps out in, in, you know, in whatever way you want to do it. Having that mix is important, I think. Yeah, we have a very similar process at Nightly Show, um, except for when we're in the, you know, people come and bring ideas. So, you know, we'll get the email from our researchers and say, like, here are some top stories, here are some things that Larry's really interested in, and then we'll come in and we'll pitch ideas based on those stories, and then maybe two people have a similar take, or two people really are vibing on something, um, and our head writer will say, well, do the two of you guys want to work on this, or do you want to work on it separately? Um, and then we kind of decide... You know, and then throughout the day, you might get an email from someone that says, oh, I saw this really funny thing that might work for the take that you're writing, or this might be, like, the right thing. Um, and then, you know, that's a sign so that we can kind of lay out the, the, the format of the show. Did you have the same experience? No, actually, uh, uh, on the Tonight Show or Late Show or a show like that, uh, there's very little group writing, which I think surprises a lot of people. Uh, most of the writing is is writers sitting alone in their offices coming up with their own ideas. Uh, if it's an idea like a commercial parody that that where you'd write a script, the writer will write the script, or the writer will go into somebody other writer's office and say, "I have this idea. You want to work with me on it?" Uh, but there's very there are very few times where when the whole writing staff or most of the writing staff is sitting around a table pitching jokes. So something that's been talked a lot about recently is the abundance of late night shows and how many of them there are now. Um, I think even just in the last two years, there have been so many new ones. You know, there's Samantha Bee and The Nightly Show is only in its second year, I think. Um, and I'm curious what you guys think about how the abundance of shows or, you know, the many more options for people who are interested in late night for what they want to watch how that affects your writing you know is there do you feel any kind of different pressure in terms of um a particular take or um pressure to have a certain kind of format um you know given that there are so many things that people can be watching i think that uh, the it, it's beneficial to everybody because it really heightens the importance of uh the unique voice every host brings to the show and i think that it's great because i don't really worry that watching um that you know that samantha b will come up with the exact same joke and tell it in the same way that trevor will the same way that larry will the same way that oliver will um because they each have their perspective that kind of is overriding um 
any particular story. I think that might be a little bit more difficult. I probably like the network shows. I think might have a bit more of a difficulty in that because I think monologue jokes tend to have a little less room for for voice adaptability than the late night shows that have like a longer sort of t a lot. They spend a lot more time within one particular story and can like flesh out their own opinions on it. Right, and and also in a the late night shows like the the, the network shows. It, at least when I was on The Tonight Show, I, I did think about the competition. I thought about uh, Dave Letterman doing The Late Show, and I, and I thought, okay, what, what can we do on The Tonight Show that, that Jay would be good at, that Jay would enjoy doing, that, that people aren't seeing from Dave, and, and that we can write, and that would be funny, and let's do that stuff, because people are getting a lot of good stuff from Dave. Let's not do the same thing. So it's, maybe that's just my, uh, my MBA, my, my business school marketing background. <laughs> thinking you think of the competition what what do people want and are they getting that from the competition and if you can do it better then then do it so uh so yeah if if i were in that position if i were working on on the late show now or tonight show i i would pay attention to what the other shows are doing what conan is doing yeah i always think it's beneficial to see what other people are doing because you can learn from them you can see what they're doing right and you can see what they're doing wrong and you can see where there's a void you know, I think that that's any medium. When you want to find what your niche is, you have to look at the landscape and say, what's the story? What's the perspective that's missing? Um, but me, day to day, because I'm so new, I just try to get through the day. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm a cog in the wheel in the sense that, like, I don't have to think about that. I have to think about trying to make the best show possible. Um, and so there are other people whose job is to think about the numbers and who's watching and, and, and those things. And so um, I'm really just trying to still learn and, and have as much fun and experiment as much as I can. Thank you. Um, our final question. Hi. Um, I just want to start by saying uh, I have a master's in international affairs, so it's really nice to see some folks still doing OK in the comedy world with <laughs> secondary degrees. Um, I feel, uh, so I'm a writer and performer uh, just around town, <laughs> and I feel a lot of pressure to be doing everything. So doing online stuff, performing live, uh, you know, performing every night, collaborating, honing my own voice, working on a script or two, and a packet here. And I'm wondering, um, in your experience, just I'd love to hear how you balanced those pressures. Um, and either, you know, before you had writing jobs, and then even now, if you're still feeling that pressure to work on other projects. That is, the struggle is so real. Um, if you follow me on Snapchat, you know that like every day I have a breakdown about this. It's really, really hard. It's so hard. And I think that you have to remember that everyone's path is different. And that while it's great to be inspired by what other people are doing, like if you're comparing yourself to other people, then that's taking away time that you could be working on what it is that you want to work on. And what I try to do is I try to set goals for myself for the month, for the year, for the week, for the day, and I just try to take it like one day at a time, you know? And the thing is, is you can't be everywhere at once. I think the goal should be to be the best at the things that you're doing, and then when you're ready to move on to the next thing, pick up another thing, and there's no reason that you know, if you're writing a script, it's great if you can write the script right now, but you can write the script next month. You can write the script. The, if, if you're doing something right now, you want to do it the best you can rather than spreading yourself too thin. That's what, that's what's worked for me. Um, yeah, I w yeah, definitely agree with that. It's, it's exhausting and there's a lot of pressure that you feel all the time about what else I should be doing. But I do think um, one way to get around that is to follow... Um, the funniest ideas you have, however you want to express them, whether on a stand-up set or in a tweet or a spec script, don't follow the format that you think you should be following and sit around thinking like, what kind of a tweet should I send out? What kind of a, a script should I write? If you have a funny idea, follow those uh, and you'll end up having funny ideas in multiple m formats more than like thinking how in how many formats you've got to spread yourself around. But I agree, but that's, a coping mechanism I use, uh, and it's just as valid as any other coping mechanism. Jeff? And, and if you're putting together a writing sample, just uh, be aware that y you can you can work on evergreen material. If it's, uh, if it's uh, even monologue jokes, you can write a joke 
about uh, an, an odd news topic where nobody will ever know a year from now whether that was a current joke that you wrote or, because they didn't see the story originally. But it could be a joke about some obscure odd news thing. You can look up odd news and, and, uh, and that can be in your packet a year later. And n nobody would ever know that you've been slaving over the wording for, for 12 months to get that joke just perfect. Uh, a desk piece idea, a good desk piece idea is, is, will be solid gold next year as, as it is now. So um, certain uh, material have to you'll have to refresh if it's topical, but a lot of it can be evergreen. And, and so you can, you can be working on that all the time and in and, and a year or so have a great packet. Oh, I'll say one more thing. Sometimes you can take one idea and format it for different places. So like maybe you have a really great script idea like that could become a really good web series or that could be there might be a really funny joke in there that's a really great tweet or maybe there's one scene of that that you can make a sizzle reel out of or you know what I mean like you don't necessarily have to like reinvent the wheel for every different medium you can just take one really or maybe there's one really good character that you can pull out and turn into a an, an improv or a, you know a stand-up set or something like that. Um, so without, I, uh, I want to thank our panel very much. My love of the internet really kind of got me interested in making content for YouTube. Uh, YouTube was launched my senior year of college. I had always been really um, active on the internet, and it was a really great place for me to showcase the things that I was interested in while also working a boring job as a graphic designer. Um, and the most Cliff Notes version is I had been making videos for four years when I had a viral video in 2012, Shit White Girls Say to Black Girls. And I was able to um, make lots of white girls cry and quit my day job and then um, you know make tons of videos, which was very exciting. And then I was a guest on Larry Wilmore's show. And um, after I was a guest, I had a meeting with them, and they were like, why don't you work here? And I was like, why don't I work here? <laughs> um, and yeah, and so, so now here I am, a fresh, a fresh three months in, giving advice as if I know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, but it's been, it's been really exciting, and TV is something I've always wanted to do, and so I'm very fortunate that YouTube was able to open that door for me because I started making videos because I didn't find a place for myself in mainstream media as a black woman, um, and I wasn't seeing the types of stuff that I wanted to do, so I was able to make it, and then now I'm at a place where the things that I've made have opened a door for me to have a, a regular, really cool job. I, I have another untraditional uh, root story into comedy writing. I uh, started writing in, in high school, and I was a really good student and, and did my physics and math and everything, but uh, when it came time to, to keeping a journal, which was one of the assignments, I, I discovered that was what I really enjoyed doing. I looked forward to actually writing. Uh, so I, I took that to heart and uh, got into Harvard and majored in engineering and applied physics. Uh, so, so, so the lesson there is just pay attention to what you really enjoy doing, even in high school or in college, because that, that could turn out to be something that you, you make your career at. So I studied engineering, um, uh, but uh, every day at the end of the day after classes, I would drop by the Harvard Lampoon. I got on the Harvard Lampoon, and that was where I wound up spending most of my time and where I really discovered that it's fun to make fun of people and, and, and write jokes. So uh, I took that to heart and uh, worked in marketing, went to business school. <laughs> um, I still was resisting the idea that you could actually make a living uh, writing comedy. Eventually, I, I had friends who left the Lampoon and were starting to get into television. Uh, a good friend of mine uh, was one of the early writers on Saturday Night Live, and uh, he turned out to be uh, David Letterman's early head writer, one of his early head writers, in addition to Meryl Marco. And uh, at one point, he and a few other writers on, on Late Night with Dave Letterman were thinking of leaving, and 
and Jim, my friend, didn't want to leave Dave without a writing staff, so he started asking his friends who he thought might be interested in. Well, um, I am personally excited really to be here with all of you because my background and my very first job was answering Lorne Michaels' phone. Um, and in doing so, um, I was able to work on several of his shows. And probably the biggest lesson that I got out of that experience is that comedy writers specifically are brilliant and that comedy writers in late night are beyond brilliant. There's a special thing in having to uh, answer to what's going on in a topical way um, that I think is unlike most other mediums and un unlike most other formats. Um, so I'm hopeful we can talk a bit about that and what that is for each one of you. Um, one of the things I'd like to start with is truly how each of you got involved, whether or not this was a passion, something you, were you watching Johnny Carson as a kid? Is this something you fell into? Um, but how did this end up being a, a, tr a profession for you? Um, Jubin, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, uh, let's start with me because it's the most boring answer. Uh, it was a very classic, uh, I was like a short, ugly little kid in middle school and, and made jokes to fit in with every peanut buddy. Um, and that's kind of what, how I started getting like a sense of humor. Um, whatever sense of humor I had was mostly just trying to like impress uh, bullies enough not to beat me up. Uh, and Writing comedy, would you like to, s to write a submission packet and try to get a job on late night? And I said, yeah, <laughs> that sounds great. Because I, I, I thought that all my friends who were doing that were having a lot more fun than I was. Uh, so I, I wrote a submission packet and, and that was, uh, I got hired. I was lucky enough to get hired in the early days of Late Night with David Letterman and it actually worked and, and it stuck and I discovered I could do it and uh, I, that turned out to be what I made my living doing. So uh, so now is a great time to, to be exploring comedy if you're thinking of that. Uh, now you're in college, uh, join a sketch group, write comedy, do YouTube videos because uh, that's, that's where the seeds were planted for my career and uh, I didn't really pay attention to them. Uh, I'm glad I went to business school because I, I learned to do things there that I, I still use today. I, I picked up some tools there, but, uh, but you don't have to go to business school to, to make a career in television comedy. Um, and then I know that you have a clip that you could show, Francesca, maybe that will give a bit of an idea of a certain kind of segment. Um, and you could give us a little color going into it about about what it is. Sure. Um, so, you know, it's really cool that The Nightly Show has given me an opportunity to merge my voice with the show. And, you know, I am someone who lives, eats, sleeps, and breathes internet for better or for worse. Um, and so Larry posed the idea that I could create a segment that is about some trends that are happening on the internet. So um, I recently started a new segment called Hack. And I think from, I guess I always had that um, interest uh, in the back of my mind, but I never uh, grew up thinking that comedy was a profession that I could realistically pursue. Uh, I ended up uh, being a lawyer for about four years. I went to law school and practiced law here in New York um, for from 06 to 2010. Uh, at the same time, I did I started doing uh, improv comedy at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater uh, in Manhattan. Um, and over time, as I performed there and sort of rose in the comedy scene, my friends started getting jobs in professional late night shows, professional writing jobs in late night shows, and I began getting the feeling that that's something I could do too. Uh, and in 2010, I, I left my firm and made the jump to comedy writing full time. And I then, my first job uh, in comedy writing was The Daily Show, which is outrageously fortunate and I would not recommend uh, as, as a realistic career path for anybody, but that's how I ended up getting my job. Thanks. Thanks. So I have a completely non-traditional uh, career path, and I'm the baby on this panel. I've been at The Nightly Show for officially three months. Yeah! Woo. So take all my advice with a grain of salt. Um, so I went to school for acting um, and then transferred and studied graphic design after I realized that I'd make a terrible waitress because um, I'm very clumsy. And... Um, 